Good afternoon. Again, we are reading through the last week. And today, the authors are uh, Marcus J. Borg and John Dominique Croissant. And today, we are venturing into Tuesday of Holy Week. So, get comfy. Put in your headphones. <laughs> All right. This Tuesday starts with Mark 11, verses 20 through 25. In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus told him, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt it in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Whenever you are standing praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Amen. <clears throat> so Tuesday is a busy, full day. Mark's narrative of the day's events covers almost three chapters, a total of 115 verses. The next longest days are Thursday, which is 60 verses, and Friday, which is 47. Tuesday is thus the longest day in Mark's story of Jesus' final week. About two-thirds of Tuesday consist of conflict within the temple authorities and their associates. The remaining third, chapter 13, warns of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and speaks of the coming of the Son of Man all in the near future. The day begins with a flashback to Monday by closing the frame of the fig tree around the temple incident. Tuesday morning, as Jesus and his followers return to Jerusalem from nearby Bethany, where they had spent the night, they see the fig tree withered away to its roots. The fig tree symbolizes Jerusalem and the temple. Mark juxtaposes the withered fig tree with a saying about this mountain, that is Mount Zion, on which the temple stood, being thrown into the sea. In closing as an opening, the fig tree frames and reflects on Jesus' deed and word in the temple. As Tuesday continues, Jesus and his followers arrive in Jerusalem and enter the temple, not meaning the sanctuary itself, which was quite small, but the large open-air courts and porticos of the temple platform. This area was often the scene of teaching, and during Passover week it was thronged with pilgrims. All of Mark 11:25 through 12:44 happens in this very public setting. The authorities and their associates challenge Jesus with a series of questions intended to entrap and discredit him. Jesus responds in an equally challenging way, sometimes turning the questions back upon them, sometimes directly indicting them. To use technical scholarly language, these are challenge and reposit stories. So again, they come to Jerusalem. As he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders come to him and say, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will give you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? Answer me. They argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say of human origin, they were afraid for the crowd, for all regarded John as truly a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And that's Mark 11, 27 through 33. As Jesus enters the temple area, the authorities immediately question him about his authority. Mark names the interrogators as the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. The first two groups were at the top of the local system of collaboration and domination, and the scribes were a literate class employed by them. They asked Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? The question refers to Jesus' prophetic act in the temple on Monday, and Mark's use of the plural things suggests Sunday's provocation entry into the city may also be included. The question is intended to lure Jesus into making a claim that might incriminate him. 
Jesus parries the question by offering to answer it as if they were the first one of his. Then he asks them a question about his mentor, John the Baptizer. Did the authority for his baptism come from heaven? That is, was it from God or was it of human origin? The question puts the authorities on the defensive. They confer among themselves. Either response would have discredited them. The first would have opened them up to a charge of hypocrisy. The second risked turning the crowd against them. Indeed, as Mark tells us, they were afraid of the crowd. Not liking either option, they say, we do not know. At best, it is an awkward response. We may imagine chagrin and clenched teeth, then keeping his end of the bargain, Jesus refuses to answer their question. He has not only evaded their trap, but made them look foolish. It is brilliant. And Mark 12, 1 through 12 reads, Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat and others they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? Will he come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others? Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is amazing in our eyes. When they realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd, so they left him and went away. Now Jesus takes the initiative. At the beginning, Jesus tells a parable about a vineyard. The story is familiar with great care. A man plants a vineyard, puts a fence around it, digs a pit for the wine press, erects a watchtower, and then leases it to tenants. When the owner sends a servant to collect his share of the produce, the tenants beat him and send him away with nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the owner sends several more servants. Some are beaten, some are killed. And the owner sends his own son, his beloved son, because he believes they will respect him. But instead, the son, the heir, arrives, and the tenants, thinking to have the vineyard for themselves, kill him also. Commonly called the parable of the wicked tenants, this story might better be called the parable of the greedy tenants. Of course they are wicked, they kill people, but the motivation for their murderous behavior is greed. They want to possess the produce of the vineyard for themselves. As many of the parables of Jesus do, the story concludes with an invitation to its hearers to make a judgment about what they have heard. Jesus asks, what then will the owner of the vineyard do? Jesus supplies the obvious answer. He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Christian interpretation of this parable has most often emphasized a Christological meaning as if its purpose is to proclaim that Jesus is the beloved son sent by the vineyard owner. Much scholarly endeavor has been expended on this issue. Some scholars argue that the parable goes back to Jesus and is thus evidence that the historical Jesus saw himself as the beloved son of God. Other scholars argue that Jesus did not make such a claim for himself and thus suspect that the parable is a post-Easter creation of the early Christian movement. We do not need to enter into this debate, for our focus is on what the parable means as part of Mark's story of Jesus' final week. Although for the author of Mark, Jesus is of course the Son of God, the primary meaning of the parable is not Christological. Rather, as Mark tells us at the end of the story, it is an indictment of the authorities. They realized he had told this parable against them. They refers to the chief priests, elders, and scribes of the previous episode, those at the top of the local domination system. They are greedy and murderous. They rejected and killed the servants and son sent by the owner of the vineyard. The next scripture reading is Mark 12, 13 through 17. 
Then they sent him to some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show difference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? By knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. And they brought one. Then he said to them, <clears throat> Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Jesus said to them, Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed. As often happens in the interpretation of the Bible, there are habituated ways of seeing this passage that gets in the way of seeing its meaning in the context of Mark's story about Jesus' last week. In the centuries after the Gospels became sacred scripture for Christians, they were often read as divine pronouncements about doctrinal and ethical issues central to the Christian life. Once this had happened, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's was understood as a solemn statement about the relationship between civil and religious authority, between politics and religion, or in Christian terms, between church and state. It has been most commonly understood to mean that there are two separate realms of human life, one religious and one political. In the first were to render to God, and in the second were to render to Caesar. What this means in practice has varied significantly. It has been understood to mean absolute obedience to the state, notoriously by the majority of German Christians during Hitler years, but the attitude is far more common. Long before the modern era, monarchs and their supporters used this verse to legitimize their authority. Their subjects were to obey them because Jesus said that their political obligation belonged to the ruler's realm. More recently, many American Christians used it during the civil rights era to criticize acts of civil disobedience. This verse, they argued, means that they are to be obedient to civil authority, even if we might also want to modify its laws. Some use it today to argue that Christians in the United States must support the government's decision to go to war in political matters, we are to obey our government. Other Christians do not argue for absolute obedience to government, regardless of its character, but nevertheless think that the verse does mean that religious obligation and political obligation are and should be basically separate. But the heavy weight given to this verse is a solemn pronouncement about the relationship between religion and politics obscures what it means in Mark. The story in which the verse appears continues the series of verbal confrontations between Jesus and his opponents. The stories are marked by attack, parry, counterattack, by trape, escape, trap, escape, and counter trap. To imagine their purpose is to provide a settle of eternal truths about how human life should be ordered is to ignore the larger narrative of which they are a part. Seeking to set away this habituated way of seeing this story, we return to the narrative. People identified as some Pharisees and some Herodians are sent to Jesus by authorities. The Pharisees were a Jewish movement committed to an intensification of traditional religious practices, including Sabbath observance and purity laws. Not only were these part of the covenant with God given to Moses at Mount Sinai, they were also a form of resistance to assimilation, to Hellenistic and Roman cultural imperialism. Though we know very little about Herodians, they were, as the name implies, supporters of the Herods, the royal family of the client rulers appointed by Rome. Both here and earlier in the Gospel, Mark reports that these two groups were allied with each other and in league with the authorities. They ask Jesus a question intended to trap him in what he said. They begin with fawning prologue, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show difference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. They then ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Should we pay them or should we not? It was a volatile question. 
Ever since the Jewish homeland had been added to the Roman Empire, Rome had required a large tribute from the Jewish people. Rome did not collect tribute directly from its individual subjects. Rather, local authorities were responsible for its payments. Though tribute included the per capita or head tax levied on the adult Jewish men, the annual sum due to Rome included much more. Most of this was gathered through taxes on land and agricultural production. All of this together contributed to tribute to Rome. It was the way the empire profited from its possessions. Roman taxation was onerous, not only because it was economically burdensome, it also symbolized the Jewish homelands, lack of sovereignty. It underlined the oppression of the Jews by the alien Lord as the word tribute itself suggests. The spokesmen of the authorities set the trap skillfully. Either answer would get Jesus in trouble. If Jesus were to answer no, he would be charged with advocating denial of Rome authority. If he were to answer yes, he risked discrediting himself with the crowd. Roman rule and taxation, who were both economic and religious reasons, were resented. Most likely, this was the primary purpose to the question, to separate Jesus from the crowd by leading him into an unpopular response. Jesus' response is masterful. As he did in the question about authority, he turns the situation back on his opponents. He sets a counter trap which he asked to see a denarius. A denarius was a silver coin equal to approximately a day's wage. His interrogators produce one. Jesus looks at it and says, whose head is this and whose title? Or in other words of an older translation, whose image and inscription is this? We all know their answer, the emperors. Jesus' strategy has led his questioners to disclose to the crowd that they have a coin with Caesar's image on it. In the moment, they are discredited. Why? In the Jewish homeland in the first century, there were two types of coins. One type, because of the Jewish prohibition of graven images, had no human or animal images. The second type, including Roman coinage, had images. Many Jews would not carry or use coins of the second type. But Jesus' interrogators in the story did. The coin they produced had Caesar's image along with the standard and idolatrous inscription heralding Caesar as divine and son of God. They are exposed as part of the politics of collaboration. Jesus's rhetorical strategy is brilliant. Their trap has been evaded. His counter trap set and sprung. Thus, even before the famous words about rendering to Caesar, Jesus has won the encounter. But there is more. He responds to their initial question. His response is in two parallel halves. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's Give to God the things that are God's. Following immediately upon the disclosure that they are carrying a coin with Caesar's image, the first half of the saying means simply, it's Caesar's coin, give it back to him. This is in effect a non-answer to the larger question, should we pay taxes to Caesar? It cannot be seen as an endorsement of paying taxes to Rome or Rome's rule. If Jesus had wanted to say pay taxes to Caesar, he could simply have answered yes to their question. There would have been no need for a scene with the coin, the central element of the story. The non-answer is not simply a dismissal of the issue. However, the second half of Jesus' response is both evocative and provocative. Give to God the things that are God's. It raises the question, what belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God? For Jesus and many of his Jewish contemporaries, everything belongs to God. So their sacred scripture affirmed. The land of Israel belongs to God. Recall Leviticus 25, 23, which says that all are tenant farmers or resident aliens on land that belongs to God. To use today, Tuesday's language, the vineyard belongs to God, not to local collaborators, not to Rome. Indeed, the whole earth belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So what belongs to Caesar? The implication from Jesus is nothing. Okay, so this chapter goes on for lots more pages, and I would love to take you through all of them. 
but I don't think we have time or anyone will watch the video beyond 20 so minutes. So ponder that in your comings and goings, more likely your staying puts today. Um, as you wander about your home, as you ponder what this week looks like, um, especially considering the nature of the Holy Week, this idea that all things, all creation, all people belong to God. As I have ended in the other verses or the other chapters, today's Tuesday prayer, we will once again pray the same prayer. Please bow your heads. Loving God, you are our creator and sustainer. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. And so we look to you whenever we are in need, trusting in your love and your abundant goodness. As you once fed the hungry crowds with five loaves and two small fish, we ask that you would again fill those who are empty this day. Pour out your spirit on all who hunger and thirst. We pray for those who are physically hungry, whose stomachs are empty. We think of people around the world who are facing critical food shortages who are suffering the effects of malnutrition, starvation, and illness, and watching helplessly as loved ones grow sick and die. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that they may be filled. We pray for those who are emotionally empty, who are lonely and long for companionship and love, who are caught in the grip of depression or overwhelmed with grief. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that they may be filled. We pray for those who are spiritually empty, who are troubled and don't know where to turn, who long for purpose and meaning but don't know where to look, who need you but do not yet know you. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that they may be filled. God, we praise you for your abundant gifts in our lives. Pour out your spirit on us as well. Fill us with your compassion and love so that we would willingly share some of your abundance with those who have need. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that we may be filled. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who came so that all humanity may come to know the abundant life that comes from you. And we say all of this using the prayer that you've taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go in peace. I look forward to seeing you again. I'll be back tomorrow for Wednesday's reading. And I hope you are having a blessed holy week, even amidst the COVID-19 lockdown, pandemic, everyone stay inside situation. I hope you have found a lawn chair to sit in your driveway or a back porch to loiter on to get some of the sunshine. That would be very good for you. Call me if you need me. Talk to you soon.